guide. I'd like to start by saying there is now a need for a new look at literacy, a term which I am using is meta-literacy. Meta-literacy is a new term for literacy in digital culture because we can all communicate with many digital tools all over the world, simultaneously, anytime we choose. Literacy used to mean reading and writing, primarily in print. But today, most content is born digital. Literacy in digital culture requires juggling formats, both physical and digital, virtual. We are all now required to become good digital citizens as most of our communication and information intake is in digital formats. Here we are interacting as avatars, which is a digital embodiment of each one of us. So I'm going to ask you to please type a Y in the text chat, the local chat, if you feel that digital citizenship is important. Or type an N if you're unfamiliar with the term digital citizen. Let's see a Y in the local chat. Who understands that it's important? N, I see some people are not familiar with digital citizenship. Great, we will talk about it today and you will walk away understanding that we are all digital citizens. Here in a virtual world and also on your cell phones and digital devices that are around us every day and in our pockets. I'm gonna move over to this slide and you can zoom in. Alvin Toffler, he's a well-known futurist. He coined the term prosumer when he saw that individuals were beginning to create and share content themselves. In the past, most things that we read were in newspapers and books and subject experts published them. Now, anyone can produce media. It's what we call user-generated content. The information hierarchy toppled during my career as a librarian. Now that was an exciting time to have everything turned upside down. We have far more user-generated content than traditional media formats, such as books. YouTube. It's become probably the number one source of information on the planet. You can learn to do anything from paper airplanes to plumbing problems. And social media platforms like TikTok have become the number one source for communication and even receiving news on social media. We are both consumers and producers of media. You put those two words together and you get prosumers. With all this user-generated content being uploaded every single moment of every day, we are bombarded by information constantly. This is a challenge to literacy, the sheer volume of information we get every day. And it illustrates the need to rethink about literacy. So a question for you, how many of you upload content online? Please type the platform where you upload or you post content often. Maybe it's Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Maybe you have a blog, Twitter, X, Twitch, Discord, TikTok, or, or other apps and sites. Please type one in the local chat that you sometimes post content on a platform. Great, Instagram is very popular, especially with young people. A website, yes, research, research platforms, LinkedIn for professional communication. So many examples of how we are prosumers creating our own content. And this was something Alvin Toffler talked about way back in the 1980s. He was definitely a futurist. 
Alvin Toffler also has a famous quote, which I like to use often. It relates to changing literacy. He said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who can, cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Think about that for a minute. Our sites and applications are constantly changing and upgrading, and we have to unlearn them and relearn them. Our, they're updating, upgrading, changing, and sometimes I work with elderly people in my physical library, and they find this constant change and upgrades and different apps a huge challenge because they learned in a more linear way. Learn something, master it, and you got it. That's no longer true. This constant oscillation, a swinging between production and consumption of media, and a swinging between physical and digital formats, it aligns to our philosophical moment, which I call metamodernism. I didn't come up with that term, but there are many who are using it. Metamodernism is the term that many people are now using to identify our current philosophical moment because postmodernism has ended. Of course, it's difficult to name and fully understand our historical moment while we are in it. Time will tell. Some people are calling our current era post-postmodernism, but I think that sounds redundant. Acquiring knowledge in the past, as I mentioned, meant climbing a ladder toward mastery. But not anymore. In metamodern culture, we learn new tools and apps constantly while evaluating live information and adapting to new devices and software updates. There's no end to the incoming stream of information. My book, which was on my first slide, Metamodernism and Changing Literacy, addresses the challenge we face due to these changes. It is imperative that we each understand our personal responsibility as digital citizens. So I'll move over to my meta-literacy slide. I've introduced you to this term that I believe fits with this personal responsibility at any age from young kids, and I've worked with, with them as young as kindergarten, through the elderly, meta-literacy. What is literacy in digital culture? Well, Mackey and Jacobson in 2014 first coined this term to help us better understand how we can be literate in digital culture as prosumers working in virtual communities. This is essential to digital citizenship. And you can find out more about metaliteracy at metaliteracy.org, where I shared a guest blog post, which actually mentions using virtual worlds. You can look at that post later. Zoom in with your camera, your alt left mouse button, and you can zoom in on the wheel here, the circle, and you can see that we each play many roles as a meta-literate individual, as both a consumer and a producer of content, being prosumers. I like to say that the internet connected everyone and gave everyone a voice, yet not everyone has something meaningful to add to the conversation. The internet has become a flood of information that is impossible to navigate without meta-literacy. If you zoom in on the circle, you'll see the many roles you can have as a participant, a communicator, a translator, an author, a teacher, that would be a peer teacher, 
a collaborator, a producer, a producer being a builder of 3D assets, a publisher, a researcher. All of these roles are at your fingertips in digital culture. Once we understand what it means to be prosumers and participants in digital culture, well, unless you're a hermit high up in the mountains and you have no internet action at all, but that's very rare, we become aware of the need for digital citizenship. And we can learn to be an ethical contributor and participant. So now that I've mentioned a bit about your roles and the many roles as digital citizens, do you feel it's important for you to be an ethical digital citizen? Type a, a Y or an N. Yes, Sabrina says yes. Being ethical is very important. You are who you are, whether you're in the physical world or you're standing here as an avatar. I'll jump over to my wheel. I told you that everyone has a voice online, but not everything shared is good, meaningful, or even true. In fact, Mackie and Jacobson, who coined the term meta-literacy, believe we live in a post-truth world. The many elements of digital citizenship are beyond the scope of this short talk. This is but an overview. But these elements cover ethical use of information, cybersecurity and safety, communication, privacy, and even emotional intelligence. Take a look at this digital citizenship wheel beneath me and zoom in on these elements. This is from the DQ Institute, and it's but one model for digital citizenship. There are, there are many. The Community Virtual Library has built a digital citizenship museum in the virtual world of Kitely. And we have library branches in other virtual worlds besides Second Life. You can find out more about that on our website. But when you zoom in on the colorful spokes here, you can see the blue and green and orange and pink. You'll see that meta-literacy intersects with all of these concepts. This is all a part of lit literacy in digital culture. Each one of you have a digital identity right here, standing on this platform as an avatar, and you're a real person. Digital citizenship has become essential for all ages, for each one of us. I recently did a talk on digital citizenship for the VWEC, that's the Virtual Worlds Education Consortium, and they have an expert series. You can view my talk here later if you're interested in digging into these concepts a little deeper. So you can tell that meta-literacy in meta-modern culture requires balance. And you can zoom in here on the rocks and see that we're balancing so many different forms of literacy. I was a school librarian for 20 years, and I witnessed something amazing, the close of the Gutenberg parentheses because print was no longer king of information. That felt really strange, standing amidst stacks and stacks and shelves of books. And now when you zoom in on the rocks, we have social media, podcasts, blogs, websites, databases, virtual worlds, ebooks, all these different formats. The Gutenberg parentheses closed that 500 peri period of time from about 1500 when the Gutenberg Press was invented to about the turn of the century, around 2000. 500 years when print was king. That's over. The Gutenberg parentheses during that period made books accessible to anyone. Prior to that, 
Stories were told orally. Only the very wealthy had access to information. But now, fixed print media is giving way to fluid digital media. No more printed en encyclopedias or gigantic dictionaries that I used to have in my school library. They're relics. Well, there are a few around, but it's much quicker to just look it up online. I want to res assign. I'm going to put it out here for you. Take a deep breath because I'm going to show you a bit about meta literacy in action. Let me pull out a sign and I'm going to ask you all to take a look at the Gutenberg parentheses sign and see if anybody knows what the image is. See the manuscript image? Anybody know what that came from? Type it in, in local chat if you know what that image is about. And let me ask you to walk over to the Gutenberg sign. You can move around as an avatar. You can walk right through it. Somebody walk over there. Walk through the sign. I see Magwa on the other side. Walk on through the sign. And think about how print was king of literacy for 500 years. And you're walking right through a beautiful manuscript from the Gutenberg Bible. Yes, we live in digital culture. Most content is born digital. Feel free to walk around, walk through the sign. But let me ask you, how many of you still enjoy reading a book in print? Anybody? You still like to turn pages, hold it in your hands? As a librarian, of course I do. You can see I wear them on my head as a tip of the hat to print. And yes, though I think print books will always be around, but sometimes, other formats have a purpose, and they are convenient, and they will continue to change. But feel free to type a Y if you still enjoy books. Juggling all of these tools that are on the rocks on the slide below me, it's actually changing the human brain. As you scroll, 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 and jump from hyperlink to hyperlink, our brains are changing. They used to be more linear, on a linear path to find information. And this juggling is a meta-literacy skill that's part of digital citizenship. Great, someone's saying, I'll never change my print books for digital versions. A print book is something tangible that you can hold and it is yours. Digital content, not so easy. One can get sucked away by the stream of social media into a self-absorbed whirlpool. More on the dark side of digital culture in my book, and there is a dark side. And yes, Magua asks, what about newspapers? Where I live, very few people now are taking a newspaper. Newspapers have really shrunk in popularity. We also juggle between worlds. We juggle the physical world, the virtual world, or the augmented world. Choosing the best space for a specific purpose, working, gaming, social interaction, learning, that's also a meta-literacy skill. I love that Lucia is saying touch, smell, feeling goes with print books. I love that they're all different, different sizes, different textures of paper, old and crinkly and smelling of dust. This is a balancing act that is now a personal responsibility. New platforms are emerging constantly with virtual reality headsets and 360 degree videos becoming mainstream. Meta-literacy is indeed a balancing act. Do any of you avatars standing around me here have a VR headset? Type a Y or an N. Both Sidearm and I have explored many VR headset platforms as well as what we call VR desktop platforms like Second Life. I consider this virtual reality. And I prefer Second Life to my VR headset, which makes me feel trapped. I feel 
just as immersed here in Second Life as I do in a VR headset, but I have many more tools available at my fingertips for building and communicating. And I don't feel trapped when I'm immersed here. I'm going to take away my Gutenberg sign and jump over here on my avatar slide. You can see on the next slide a picture of my physical world person in the physical world and my avatar person, both are real, with my books on my head. So think about yourself as an avatar here at this moment. We're together in a real place. I'm going to zoom my camera out and look at all of you. You are real people. What does it mean to be a live avatar in the metaverse versus being a live being in the physical world? I am me in both places. So I'm going to jump down here for a minute and ask you all to walk because we can. <laughs> We can walk around together. Follow me. Walk with me. Oh, back over to the front of the ramp and just stand at the ramp with me. I'm going to turn around and look at all of you avatars. Excellent. When you get really comfortable as an avatar and comfortable moving around in this virtual place, do you consider it real? Type a Y or an N. It took me a while after a few months of really getting comfortable with the place. I have real memories of it. It's as real as the physical world. It's just in a different way. Is the metaverse a real place? I've come to believe that it is. Yes, Mag was saying, otherwise I was leaving an illusion for the last 15 years or so. Yes, and I've been around here for... As I said, about 17 years, I've made real relationships with real people and have real memories of those relationships and experiences. So yes, the information revolution has changed literacy forever. We live in a fascinating, fast-paced time, no matter what it's called. But I've adopted the term metamodernism, metamodernism to use in discussion of our current philosophical era. Although I mentioned there are other names in the, in the running, postmodern, postmodernism or hypermodernism, those are in the running too. But I present this topic to you today here in the metaverse, a place where metadata constructs a simulation of reality. So think about that. We're here inside a metaphor of our world. And as you think about that, you are using metacognition which means thinking about thinking. About, 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 meta, meta, meta. Seems like I hear meta all the time and I don't mean Facebook. <laughs> the metaverse is a real place and it requires meta literacy. And this illustrates the importance of understanding digital citizenship and meta literacy in the metaverse and on our apps and devices, in our pockets, and in our homes. So I'm going to walk back over to my slide on our philosophical, philosophical moment, metamodernism. You can zoom in on this slide. Some pictures that correspond with what metamodernism is all about. I think we have become metamodern, and it's certainly time to become metaliterate. Metamodernism includes the way we express ourselves in our cultural era. Look at the pictures of art. We express ourselves through art, literature, music, and architecture. Architecture in 3D for example. While postmodernism is explained as sort of a tearing down of grand narratives, it brought a plethora of dystopian fiction to my library, a lot of books about zombies. Metamodernism is ushering in a new age that balances 
irony with sincerity, an age which balances a respect for tradition alongside the excitement of innovation, not throwing away everything in the past, but valuing heritage as we quickly adopt new and exciting innovations. My book looks at our philosophical eras of the past, stressing the importance of learning history. Of course, it's impossible to fully understand or to name our historical era when we're right inside living it in the present. And I mentioned it's not a fully adopted term yet, but many are starting to use it because we all seem to have a feeling that life has quickly changed. You're learning today, here at this presentation, in a virtual environment, which is a meta-literacy skill in itself. To have an avatar, move around, interact with virtual objects and others. This slide shows how di digital culture has changed learning environments. Zoom in on some of these environments on my slide. The top left, you can see traditional rows of desks. Many of you maybe have never seen a classroom like that with a chalkboard. I remember them when I was a child. And now we have augmented reality apps that are useful. I use them with kindergartners to do their book reports. We are merging into multiple realities. The top educators in VR picture was taken in a world called Altspace. And I was wearing a VR headset with other educators, and that world is no longer there. It has disappeared. An example of changing literacy, changing formats, even changing environments. And I mentioned Sidearm and I have visited many different educational environments with and without VR headsets. We've also explored AR augmented reality apps, which are also a meta literacy skill. An important part of digital metamodern culture and metaliteracy is the preservation of literacy formats. Listen up, because civilization could be doomed if you don't understand this. <laughs> I won't go into this deeply today, because this is a huge and important topic. But preservation, too, is a personal Meta literacy skill. Here's why. This is important for you. Most content, as I said, today is born digital. Think about the pictures people are taking on their phones. They're born digital. Many by far will never be print, will never be in a physical format. We must learn how to migrate to new formats, or it could all be lost, all of our content. Do you ever have concerns about archiving your, your photos and content in the future? Some of you may be really good at it, especially if you were born in digital culture and you've never even used the formats that are sitting below me here. Are most of your, digital, are your photos digital? Or do any of you have a physical album? Feel free to type in the chat. I remember finding my grandmother's physical photo album. It was black crinkly old photos glued in with little corners and seeing the pictures of them wearing their long dresses in black and white with old, old homes and objects. It was fascinating. Will our children ever find photo albums? I doubt it. Digital archival will be a problem in the future for us all individually and as a culture. John's saying he has both. I have some photo albums. But it's so much easier to take your photos, and they're all in the cloud. Of course, AI may help us with this in the future. But scroll in on these formats. Do any of you remember cassette tapes, v VHS tapes, where we could watch our shows and movies and create our own family um, <laughs> videos, and floppy disks. Look at those little three by five floppy disks. I heard when I was writing my dissertation, I was looking up digital formats and preservation, and look at the Dead Sea Scrolls there. 
When they were unearthed, you could still read them. They're physical. And a man who had just learned about the Dead Sea Scrolls being unearthed was working on a very important project, had all of his work for two years on the three by five floppy disks that you see down there on the lower left, and his disks became corrupted. He lost all of his work. If you want to archive something, it should be in two formats in two different places. <laughs> if it's really important. And what will happen to all of our digital assets, all of our virtual content, when we pass away? A whole industry is arising in the field of digital legacy. Companies like Facebook have plans for archival of content when someone dies. And John's saying he lost his undergrad thesis work in a power point, or in a power cut, power failure, because he hadn't saved it on cassette tape. Yes, it's like, that's an example of changing literacy. Cassette tapes, they're a relic now. I like to follow a, a person online who um, organizes the Museum of Obsolete Media. It's fascinating. So. I've told you a bit about the importance of preservation. That could be a whole talk in itself, but it's part of metaliteracy. And today, I've, I've given you two terms that you can take away. Metamodernism, which is our current cultural moment, and metaliteracy. Of course, more research is needed for all age groups to understand digital citizenship and how meta-literacy plays a role in that. Meta-literacy is simply a term to address literacy as prosumers. And from the meta-literacy site, the website says, meta-literacy promotes critical thinking and collaboration in a digital age, providing a comprehensive framework to effectively participate in social media, and online communities. It's a unified construct that supports the acquisition, production, and sharing of knowledge in collaborative online communities. And that is exactly what you're going to be doing in this class. I have a few references for you on this final slide here. And you can click on the blue box below if you'd like to get more information about my book on metamodernism and changing literacy. And you can read the forward introduction. So I hope that you'll ponder your own responsibility for digital citizenship. I hope you will think critically about your own changing literacy and what that means. Most of you know that the pandemic forced so many of us to use new tools. And it's not been easy for some people. You may be comfortable utilizing many digital tools and applications, but it's impossible to use them all. The incredible volume of apps and information online can be overwhelming because too much information is just as problematic as too little. We're drowning in information and we need to learn how to navigate through it. So, I mentioned the dark side of digital culture. Next, you will follow me into the darkness to contemplate some of the problems that we face. Let me jump down and tell you how to fall into the darkness. I'm just gonna walk right here. See the black pad? I'm going to ask you to touch the black pad and fall into the darkness. When you enter the blackness, find a beanbag and take a seat. Just 
click on the black pad. You can find a seat on a bean bag, get comfortable here in the black, the black dark room. And I'm going to take a seat right up here by the dark side of digital culture. I'm going to zoom out and see if we've got a couple more people heading over to the room. You may feel a little cramped and uncomfortable in here. Well, that happens in digital culture. The internet and digital culture with our many online applications contains a dark side. You can turn your environment to midnight, make it even darker, since we can in a virtual world. In the Second Life viewer, you just choose World Environment Midnight. World Environment, I'm going to go to midnight, make it even blacker. So look at the sign next to me, to my left, the dark side of digital culture. And you'll see just a few examples of some of the problems that we all have now that content is born online and now that we have our personal devices in our pockets 24-7. Each of us has a personal dashboard. Now, what's a personal dashboard? What that means, on your digital device, if you were to pull out your phone or a tablet or any small digital device or even a computer, what's on your home page? What are the top apps that are right there to touch at your, fingerprint, your fingertips? They're not the same as mine. They're not the same as the person sitting next to you. We all have a unique personal dashboard. You can colorize it, personalize it, put a family picture as your wallpaper. It's personal. And we choose our incoming information, which means we are all creating our own information landscapes. Each one's different. You're getting different news than I am. We're not living in a unified world anymore. Use your camera to zoom in in just a moment as I come to another um, part of the dark side of digital culture. Too much information. Zoom over to my right. Do you ever feel like that? You're just, your head is just exploding with clouds of bits and bytes and you don't even know where to go. Or you're zoned out in the endless scroll. I heard a young woman tell me recently that if she ever feels anxious or bored, she picks up her phone and the comfort of the endless scroll Think about it. Pros and cons. We are drowning in information and we have millions of choices to make every day of where to go. Too much information. I already told you this. It's just as problematic as too little information. During the Gutenberg parentheses, we all knew to go to libraries. We knew where to go to find the subject experts. We had a balance of where to go for information. Now that that's closed, it's, a little, it's similar to having too little access. When you type something online, you get millions of hits. And just this past year, we've added the concerns of artificial intelligence to our list of concerns. How do we use it? How will it impact our literacy, our humanity? How will it impact intellectual property? Artists, musicians, they're worried because, of course, AI can create and it can mimic real people. How many of you have tried AI? Type in the local chat. You may have tried it without even going to an app for it because many of our web browsers, of course, are based on artificial intelligence and have been for quite some time. But now with user-generated AI, we can go to applications and personalize it. Are you concerned about how AI will impact our lives? 
I used AI to write a poem because I, I love poetry and I gave it a, a prompt and within one minute, maybe it was only 30 seconds, out came an amazing poem in a rhyming stanzas, which I, I told it the style, and it was really pretty good. I found it rather creepy. I don't want to outsource my creativity, and I don't want the next generation outsourcing theirs. It will certainly impact literacy, literacy and intellectual property. And look at the slide next to it, FOMO, F-O-M-O. -O. Anybody ever experienced FOMO? I hear that this happens a lot with teenagers. FOMO, anybody know what the letters stand for? Have you ever had this sensation that there's something happening out there and you're missing out on it? Yes, Sabrina, fear of missing out. It's the anxiety that there's an exciting or interesting event happening elsewhere. And this is often aroused by posts seen on social media. Teenagers, I have heard, have their cell phone with them 24 seven. It's right by them even when they sleep. It's like their right arm. And that's caused a lot of mental health problems with some teens. And another huge problem that we all face, that's really one that's just natural with human beings, is confirmation bias. Social media apps lure us into following people that we agree with. That's only natural. We want to be around people who share our values, who agree with us. But that is not how we learn. We learn through debate and discussion of new ideas and new perspectives. Sometimes I feel like the art of debate is dying. And what about privacy? Is big data mining similar to Big Brother watching? If you've ever read 1984. Is privacy dead now that big data companies can mine our data and control the information that we receive? We have tremendous obstacles to overcome in digital culture that relate to meta-literacy. Privacy, cybersecurity, and confirmation bias, because I said it's easy to follow and interact only with those we agree with, but I remain hopeful. I do sometimes feel like Google knows more about me than I know about myself. And with AI, that will become even more of a problem because the human brain cannot remember everything. These obstacles can be seen as opportunities if we're truly aware of them. Type in the chat if you have concerns about privacy or cybersecurity. I highly value privacy, and I've said for years it died in 2008. <laughs> it's like I could just feel this sense that people don't even value their privacy. We don't even read the terms of service on our apps because they're pages long, written in legal language that we wouldn't understand anyway. So we just click, I agree. My friends and colleagues use this app. I trust them. What about privacy? Do you worry about some of these concerns about the internet and our dependency on all of our online tools? I went to a grocery store not too long ago. Well, it was actually a, a pharmacy, a drugstore. And I went and the person said, I'm sorry, we're not selling anything today. We're, the computer's down. They actually would not sell anything. That's how dependent we are on the grid. So how can we get out of this dark place, this dark room with all these problems? 
How can we overcome the dark side of digital culture? Will we keep our humanity in the metaverse? Will, be able, will we be able to tell the AI bots from the human avatars? Well, I believe we only can get out of this dark room by becoming good digital citizens, by being aware of these concerns, by working together and valuing each other as humans. So, we're going to head to the library to discuss the concerns, meta-literacy, and what digital citizenship means and why it's so important. <laughs>